Yeah. It says. Uh, we'll, we'll just dive in. Thank y'all so much for being here. Uh, I think that it's uh, an issue that we need to talk about, like the food system, where our food comes from, is something that I think matters to everybody as uh, you know we eat. So I'm Logan Duval. I'm a partner here at Me and McGee Market. Have the Sewing Prosperity platform. It's a uh, you know, education podcasting. Lots of experts that we have on. So. What uh, the catalyst for being here was, uh, we got turned into the health department for selling raw milk as pet's milk for pet consumption. So what that did was really opened up the conversation for what are our food laws? What is governing our food production? And how does that affect the consumer? How does that affect the access for people getting the food that they, they want? And uh, what, what that has done is it's been very eye-opening at the chronic disease epidemic that our country faces. Uh, my son was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer when he was 5. Uh, so as I have spent about the last 5 years diving into what is cancer, how do we overcome and prevent, uh, it ties perfectly into other chronic diseases. So it's heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, on and on are going to be these chronic diseases that we face. Our food matters with that, guys. Our, our food matters so much with that. So what's happened is we have since, I mean, since basically World War II, we had Secretary of Ag early in the 70s say, get big or get out. So we are looking at efficiency. How do we make the most food the cheapest way that we possibly can to feed the world? And to me, that's the problem, right? We shouldn't be trying to feed the world. We need to feed our communities, our community members, our farmers, our our abattoirs, right? Our butchers, our, our bakers. We should be feeding our own communities, not the world. Now, what's happened with that and why that sounds like this uh, super easy thing to fix, but it's not when you look at the regulations. The regulations are a cookie cutter size so whatever the large dairy producer has to do, this is what we have to do on the small scale. And it just doesn't work out. So when uh, we were turned in, the legislation in Arkansas is that a local dairy that's going to sell non-pasteurized milk, so this is raw milk, can produce 500 gallons a month, right? So what we're doing right out of the gate is limiting the production that somebody can do. So don't know what that is about with public safety on top of that the consumer must go to the dairy to pick up this raw milk that they want right nobody's trying to force them to drink raw milk but a consumer that wants raw milk has to go to the dairy now dairies are typically in rural areas people are typically in urban areas it's least like the population so for someone here in little rock they're going to have to drive an hour an hour and a half two hours three hours to a dairy that's limited to only producing at best 500 gallons a month. See, it doesn't really add up and this has nothing to do with public safety, right? This is not really a debate at all about if this is pasteurized or raw milk, what's better, what's safer. That's really not the point of what I'm trying to discuss. It's more about the freedom to choose as Americans if we want to buy milk and drink it and feed it to our families, we should have every right to do that without a legislator dictating what we can or can't do. And now the reason that this is a big deal and why we have to have an open discussion forum like this is that those regulations are in place, I fully believe, based on what is called corporate capture. That means the corporations, the money behind who's getting elected, campaign donations, these interests, 
these vested interests, they are going to say, I don't want that legislation. I want I want the little dairies to be limited to only 500 because that might cut into our bottom dollar. I don't want them to have easy access to consumer. I don't want a grocery store to be able to sell this raw milk. Let's make it harder so the consumer has to get it. So what they've done is they've created regulations that limit the consumer's ability and the producer's ability to produce. So we, we, we're, we're winning on, on, they are winning on both sides. My point with the Arkansas prosperity and, so, and food sovereignty proposal is simply, hey, let's treat our small farmers, right? Let's treat them different than we're trying to do for a mega conglomerate. Let's treat the small farmers with the support they need, not having them constantly trying to be in compliance, right? So that, that's my point. I've brought together friends, right, that live this. So when we're talking about these problems, we live this. We, this is not something that we're, we're just getting out of, out of the air. This is our lives. Me as a marketer, a retailer, educator, I live this every single day. My friends as farmers, whether that's dairy or more of the beef side or even the vegetable production, they also live it every single day. So we're going to hear more from them, their stories. And guys, this is as grassroots of a movement as there is. And it's about developing these little hubs of our communities supplying our communities. So next, which wherever one of y'all want to come. Next, John. Okay. All right, John Ballard. My name is John Ballard. I'm with Live Healthy Farms. We're in Bonnerdale, Arkansas. And standing in front of you here right now, five years ago, I'd have said you're nuts. I don't know what you're talking about. I lived in Grapevine, Texas, right in the middle of Dallas-Fort Worth. No idea that I would be a farmer. Can I call myself a farmer at this point? You've been there, so you, you tell me. Um, we do raw milk. So we have dairy cows. We have honey. We have tallow. We have beef. Grass-fed, grass-finished. Um, we have found in our three and a half years of doing this, there's this huge desire, this huge demand to feed our families better. And what's amazing is, is the demographic that comes and sees us is all over the board. There are people that are multimillionaires that live in the huge lake houses on Lake Hamilton. And then there are those that, you know, drive up in the vehicles and you're like is that thing even legal with seven kids and it doesn't matter what your walk of life is everybody that's coming to the farm is understanding that there is a difference in their bodies in their minds the way they sleep when they put good stuff in their bodies and I think what Logan is tapping into is what probably most of us on this journey have gotten to We've all gotten here in a different way. We've all been like pulled into this thing for different reasons. And for us, I was always about health. Um, I was always about athletics and training and making sure I'm putting good stuff in my body. My beautiful wife had moved from China, got on the American diet, and instantly got migraine headaches and sick from the American diet. And so she knew something was wrong. So her journey was different than my journey, but we ended up in the same place. And I think if we all sat down and talked to one another, we would all discover that we've all been on this same journey leading us to this same place. And, you know, I think when we first started this, we thought about self-sustainability. And that was a neat concept, right? Hey, I can do this and be self-sustainable. And I think what we've gotten to very, very recently is community sustainability. This is not about me being self-sustaining. I don't think God wants me to be self-sustaining. I think he needs me to be part of a community. And so what we see every single day coming to the farm are people that are on that journey that want community, and in that, they want to heal themselves. They want their families to be healed. And we see this all the time, it's specifically with raw milk, with kids that are on the spectrum, ADHD, Asperger's, uh, autism, you name it. Raw milk is healing. 
So we, and we could go down the road on the beef, on the grass fed, grass finished. We could go down the road on a lot of different things. But the things that Logan is hitting on and what we're experiencing, right? So it's not just somebody standing up here telling you, you want raw milk because raw milk's more healthy for you. What you have are people standing up here testifying that they're seeing it every day in their own lives. We're doing this every day. We wake up every day and we do this. And then our neighbors and community come and do this as well. And the feedback that we get is there's a difference being made in their lives. And so for anybody in this country to dictate what you can and can't put in your body, for I could argue that there's a thousand different paths you could go down and rabbit holes that we could go down and conspiracy theories that we could have. But at the end of the day, what I choose to put in my body is what I'm choosing to put in my body. People will tell you, my body, my choice. Well, it's my body, my choice, what I put in my body. And I'm choosing to do things that are more beneficial, that are healthy, and inputs into my body that not only bless me, but then bless my family. And I see that. I see that every single day. So I know that we're going to get into, you know, questions and answers and all that. And I would love to walk you guys through, like, how we do the dairy and how, how meticulous we are with every single one of our cows and how we know which gallon of milk belongs to which cow. There's not a dairy farm out there that's doing 500 cows that can tell you which cow is producing that gallon of milk because it's homogenized and there's probably 400 cows milk in that one gallon of milk. But I can tell you which cow gave you that milk. Matter of fact, I can tell you so much that I can tell you the difference between the Guernsey milk and the Jersey milk because of the color and the cream level of the milk. That's how intimately involved I am day in and day out on my farm. And I would argue that there's no big dairies out there that have that level of intimacy with their animals. The other piece of that is, is I'm putting it in my body, then whatever I'm putting in that animal is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be organic. It's going to be healthy. The forage is going to be sustainable. That animal is going to thrive, and we're going to steward that animal to produce the best milk possible. If I'm going to put it in my body and sell it to my customers, we're going to put the best inputs in that milk that we possibly can. So I could stay up here and talk all day long, but I see Joy chomping at the bit. I know you want to be next, and I'm happy to answer all the questions that you guys have later. Thank you for your time. My name is Joy Ballard, no relation to John Ballard, but um, I'm from Milk and Honey Hill Farm in New Blaine, Arkansas, and my husband and I have a 10, or I'm sorry, an eight cow Jersey herd. We do um, pretty much raw milk straight from the farm, anything that doesn't sell. I turn into cheese, I turn into butter, I turn into yogurt, and what I want to be here and share today is I'm not legally allowed to sell any of my cheese, my butter my cream, any of the dairy byproducts that I produce for my family, I'm not allowed to pass on to your family. And you know, the FDA says that if a wheel of cheese has cured for 60 days, it is safe to eat. So if the FDA says it's safe to eat, why can't I pass it on to you, right? And most of what we do, we got into because I have a kid with some disabilities and some health needs, and I needed to be able to produce food for him that healed his digestive system. And doing that and having access to that, one is very cost prohibitive. If you have to travel a long way to go get your raw milk or you know access raw cheese some other way through a company um, that is legally allowed to sell it. But I decided I'm gonna produce it for us. And so um, I taught myself how to make cheese. I've taught myself how to make butter. I now teach those classes too from my farm in New Blaine. So if you're interested in learning how to do those things, if you have access to raw milk, um, I can teach you how to do that. It's kind of intimidating to start, but it's not that difficult, really. Um, the other thing is we were really interested in providing food security for our community. So we live in a teeny tiny town of 186. And, you know, when storms come through, if a storm came through and took out a big ag farm, right, that's going to shut down supply chain for a really long time. If we support small dairies, small family farms, and a storm comes through and knocks out one or two farms, you still have food security in the other farms that are available, right? 
And so supply chain is really a passion of ours to support small farms so that we have food security for our communities. And um, I don't know, after being a veteran wife, um, my husband did 21 years serving our country. It's really important to continue serving our country and providing food security for our communities. So I'm available for questions later. Thanks. I'm Damon Helton with uh, the farm at Barefoot Bend in Lonsdale, Arkansas. Um, we founded Barefoot Bend in uh, 2012. Um, and really just um, how, how it all started was I, uh, I was traveling all the time, uh, spent a lot of time away from the family and just had a, what I affectionately refer to as my midlife crisis and uh, cashed in my 401k, sold everything out and, and bought a farm. Um, I didn't know what I was gonna do at first. Um, and then ultimately what, it, what, what, what drove me to sustainable ag, regenerative agriculture was uh, my third child, uh, Violet, um, had really bad skin conditions and uh, you know we couldn't figure it out we were going to the pediatrician trying to figure out what was going on um, and they just kept kicking around wanting to put her on different meds do different things and I had a good friend of mine said man you're raised, you've got your own farm now why don't you get into you know doing organic and I said man I'm not a hippie I never will forget I remember saying that to him and but what I didn't realize is, is what all these uh, you know what, what everybody's been saying so far is you know, we are what we eat. Well, we are what our animals eat, right? I mean, let's go to the very start of it. And uh, we have a very broken food system. It's a chemical system on, on a big scale. Um, and I'll just, I'll tell you guys right now, a preemptive strike. I'm, you know, uh, prior service military guy, I was in special operations, so I'm very raw when it comes to what I say. So I will try to uh, not get too fired up about it. But, but ultimately, you know, feeding our community, right? I mean, that's what it boils down to. And so when we started the farm in 2012 and, and saw our daughter's, you know, health dramatically change when we started raising our own food, uh, putting good nutri nutrient-dense food into her body, and then all of a sudden she changed. And I, you know, just did away with the pediatricians. We don't go to the doctors. We don't get ear infections or anything. And, and, and really, here again, what Logan was saying earlier, you look at all these ailments that are, 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 are affecting us, here, I'll go down the rabbit hole. Like, why is that? Why is that happening? It's because of what we're putting in our bodies. Um, and so I've been beating this drum for local food, community, and sustainable ag since 2012. Uh, me and McGee formed a relationship in early 2014, I think. Um, and we've just been, you know, we've been leading the charge ever since. So um, I'm, I, uh, I'm a much better person. Um, I'm not a big orator, John. It's your hard act to follow with that. Um, but I, um, I, I love this, the, the, the dialogue, the debate, getting to talk to people, um, is, is very important because ultimately what it boils down to is the educational piece and then also the choice, right? I mean, we should be able to choose. If I can choose to go buy a pack of Marlboro, why can't I buy some raw milk? You know, I mean, proven things that are, that are bad, that are absolutely out there. Uh, and then, you know, don't leave me started on the, the big boar's head recall and the Tyson's recalls. I've never had a recall on my farm, okay? Um, and the intimacy of, that we have with our animals. We can tell you exactly how old this animal is, when it was butchered, what it was, you know, when it was born, everything. And so, you know, here again, I'll, I'll tail off and I apologize, but it, it really comes down to choice. You know, the old know your farmer, know your food. When you, have a, when you have a very intimate relationship with your producer, what's coming off of your farm, what those animals lived with, you have a relationship with the producers that you can share to your customers. I mean, how can anybody argue with that? How, how, how can you, what, what case can you make to me that says our broken food system that's full of chemicals and is not nutrient dense, you know, people that drink Diet Cokes, their body craves sugar, that's why they drink 900 Diet Cokes, right? I mean, I mean, it's just the, the broken system, follow the money, you guys, like just, you know, support local. And, and I think that's, that's, where we're, that's what we're pushing for. So can't wait to have questions. That's, that's, that's really where I thrive and like to go. So thank you, guys. Hello, 
everyone. I am going to be giving a consumer point of view. So as a consumer, access to the most nutrient-dense food is a true gift from God. That which is accessed by driving to a neighboring farm and picking it up ourselves. Farmer to consumer and little to no in between. Meeting and befriending the neighboring farmers who dedicate their lives to regenerating God's greatest gift, earth. Supporting local farmers and being able to drive to their farms, pick up their products, whether it be eggs, milk, or meat, is a part of the First Amendment that should be protected, but here we are. We can talk about the nutritional value of store-bought meat versus conventionally, or sorry, um, store-bought meat versus farm fresh. I'm sure you have all seen the side-by-side -side photos of conventionally raised meat versus local farm fresh from a local farm. That on its own goes to show that the fresher the meat is, the more nutrient rich that it has, nutrients that it has. And that should all be our goal, to feed our families and our bodies the most nutrient rich foods that God has all blessed us with. As a consumer and business owner, I utilize local farm fresh products personally and professionally. With the access to local dairy farms that I have, I am able to give other people that access that they don't have it in my products. I love to practice and preach that knowledge is power. Growing up in Hawaii, my dad's favorite saying was, if you feed a hungry man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. When we independently educate ourselves, there's no person, no government that can tell us what the better choice is for ourselves and our family. Having the power of knowledge on your side gives you the confidence that you deserve. Teaching consumers what to ask for when searching for local meat, dairy, and eggs are questions like, what's the diet of the animal? Are we able to tour your facility? Um, what are the living conditions? If they are given any antibiotics, hormone steroids, are they then taken out of rotation? And more if you can think of more. Supporting local farmers, using what we have here, keeping our money in Arkansas, where we can physically see and feel the impact it has on our local economy, is, the, is a right and a privilege worth fighting for. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you to Logan and Mia McGee Market for hosting this event. Uh, and thank you to everybody here in attendance and those joining us online. Thank you so much. My name is Joshua Pavarnik. I'm here today with my beautiful wife, Hannah. You'll hear from her in just a minute. And we have two young daughters. They're ages 12 and 2, so a great spread. We live just seven minutes down the road on five acres that we purchased in 2021. And we are consumers, not yet producers, yet. <laughs> but we'll get there. And I am truly humbled to be up here amongst these brilliant and hardworking faces who represent communities, who represent the heart of America, the heartbeat of what makes us such a beautiful and great nation. So thank you all for being here. <clears throat> My background, finance and accounting. So by no means a health or food expert. I didn't know what a probiotic was three years ago. I didn't know what a live and active culture was two years ago, but I've learned a little bit along the way. However, I'm, I am a faithful man of God who loves his family. I want the best future for my children. Our family celebrates life and liberty. We put God first. We love our great state of Arkansas. We love this great country, the United States of America. We love capitalism and free markets. Yet, I am speaking today because we are sick and tired of large corporate greed, out-of-state, even out-of-country investors tearing down and tearing apart our beloved farmlands in this country, and, and sick and tired of government regulations dictating what is best for me and my household. Now, regarding raw milk. As a husband and a father, prioritizing my family's health and well-being is paramount. One of our favorite farms to go and visit for raw milk for our family's consumption is 81 miles away from here. So we make a 162-mile round trip 
to get raw milk for our family. So when you factor in, like I said, accounting and finance background, so when you factor in the cost of gas, the cost of the milk, we're spending $21 per gallon. $21 per gallon. This is what government restriction costs our family on a daily basis. Some may say that's too far to go, that's too expensive, but as a dad, you can't put a price on my kids' health and wellness. So unlike the highly processed milk products available in stores, raw milk contains natural enzymes and probiotics. So my wife is gonna come up, we have a chart. It's tiny, I apologize that it's a tiny chart, but we did print it on legal size, so it is 11 by 14. Okay, so, so raw milk benefits, okay? Enzymes, probiotics, there we go, in the sun. Healthy fats, proteins, vitamins, calcium, active, active, active. When you compare it to over here, this is raw breast milk. Active, 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 okay? This is raw milk, but then you come into pasteurized cow milk. Enzymes, inactive, probiotics, destroyed, healthy fats, altered, proteins, altered, vitamins, destroyed, calcium, inhibited. When you look at raw breast milk compared to pasteurized instant formula, destroyed, destroyed, inhibited, altered, inhibited, inhibited. God knew what he was doing when he made our bodies. This is the most natural way of living life. It's insane to me when you can tell your child, milk comes from a cow. Okay, why don't we go see that cow? Let's milk that cow. Let's, but no, don't drink the cow's milk until we destroy everything good in it. And then we wonder why we have such digestive problems. We wonder why we have so many lactose intolerant, why we've found a way to get milk out of a nut, out of an almond. I don't understand that one still. <clears throat> so I want to invite my wife to say a few words. I'm going to show a couple pictures here. This is our toddler's first time tasting raw milk. She's 14 months at that time. She tasted it and she looked straight at mama and she said, milk? <laughs> she knew what milk was and she was so happy uh, to get to taste that raw milk. Thank you. I appreciate your time. I'm no public speaker, so I won't take very much of it. But there are a few things on my heart, some frustrations on my mind that I'd like to share. By banning farmers markets and grocery stores from selling raw milk, many families are forced to choose between quality, whole foods, and less expensive conveniences. Even the less expensive items are out of control with today's economic inflation. As a family of four on a single income, we make daily decisions as to whether these healthier options are in our budget. There are some decisions that will not, we will not compromise on just because it would be easier on our bank accounts. We're here today, not just for the sake of our own family, but also on behalf of all those who long to take back authority over the food allowed into their diet. We've all heard the saying, it was said earlier, you are what you eat. Well, it's true. And personally, I believe each of us should have the power to say no to consuming things like hydrogenated fats, seed oils, artificial sweeteners and dyes, antibiotics, hormones, steroids, preservatives, and fillers. We should, in kind, have the ability to choose what to put into our diets, whether that's pasture-raised eggs, grass-fed beef, organic and fermented vegetables, or maybe the most controversial of all, raw milk. Now is it safe? Well, let me ask you this, and it was hit on earlier, how often do we hear about a recall in the grocery stores because of contamination? Handled in the wrong way, any and every kind of food can become dangerous. I'll conclude by saying that if you talk to any rancher, they can tell you that if you take a newborn calf by C-section from its mother and then you pasteurize that mother's milk, what you end up with is a calf that's either going to be chronically ill or doesn't even make it at all. And that's what we've done to our population. We've taken our food, we've denatured it, 
denatured the enzymes that are meant to help us break it down and utilize it. We've killed the probiotics that are supposed to help our guts digest that food. We've destroyed our microbiomes and our immune systems through medical interventions and over-processing over our foods. And everyone wants to know why we're all chronically ill or dying. Thank you. Good job. <clears throat> and allow us to conclude, I'm a storyteller, by sharing two simple stories from our life as parents, as a dad, as a mom. Uh, even though we're faced with daily challenges, I can truly say what a beautiful and blessed life we live. We have great friends. We have great communities. This is a great farmer's market. If you haven't checked it out, me and McGee come down here. The sun's shining. It's beautiful fall weather. There are some fantastic farms that have been advertised today as well, and they're here advocating for our community. So my 12-year-old, she recently used some A2 yogurt and other household spices to make us homemade ranch dressing. She saw each and every ingredient. She put it in the container herself. She whisked it all together. And then she even created her cute little label out of tape and put it on there. And she has been saying ever since, Dad, Mom, we should make more things homemade. We should make more things homemade. And then to my two-year-old. Our toddler woke up the other morning, ran into the kitchen with me, but then stopped dead in her tracks, looked up and shouted, bread, bread, bread. Her eyes caught glimpse of the most delicious looking loaf of bread she'd ever seen. I didn't even know that my wife had made it late at midnight the night before. We both were in awe of mama's late night baking and loving sacrifice to make homemade banana bread using her sourdough starter. Cut off a slice, add some real butter, and our toddler was in heaven that morning. So it's time for the state of Arkansas to give the power to choose real, whole food back to the people it serves. Reclaiming a farm-to-table mentality about our food strengthens our communities, promotes the sustainable practices needed for prosperity, simplicity, and freedom, sustainability, and quality love and sacrifice we won't be silent until our children have the absolute best lives that they possibly can have in our free united states of america and this my friends is the way that god intended us all to live thank you I think that this is a really wide, diverse group on the experience of what our food looks like on that local level. So legislators, please reach out. This is who we need to be talking to when we are making laws that govern the people. And I prefer they just be rolled back, but this is who we talk to. This right here are the consumers. They are far from alone. This is a large, large amount of the population that wants these things if we're going to have the regulations going forward let's, let's get a let's get a committee together right let's get an oversight take a look at my proposal i laid it out it is pretty vague but in there it's about the education that keeps us from being corporate captured going further it has a committee in there made up of our farmers and physicians that can guide it in a way that we don't have corporate capture that's that's the thing we got to protect ourselves i think the constitution is a beautiful thing i think the bill of rights is a beautiful thing and the way it was worded was for a reason the only thing that messed up is benjamin rush didn't get his way and get a little bit more on on another aspect with medical freedom if uh, you have any questions we're about to open that up uh we're gonna we're gonna stand around hang out and thank you absolutely thank you online in person for being here it means the world and we are going to make the future so much more prosperous
There's, there's no money in it for big ag when I no-till drill seed that's non-GMO, when I don't spray herbicides and pesticides, when my cows eat grass and forages that are nutrient dense because there's biodiversity and micronutrients in the soil. They can't capitalize on that. They can't make money doing that. Therefore, they don't want us to do that. Yeah. Appreciate well, I, that. Wasn't a question so much, but we, we, we understood it as a question. Well, uh, the important thing to realize is here again, we go back to just choice. I mean, there, look, there, there's no, you know, dramatic sway one way or the other, right? I mean, there is a place for pharmaceuticals and big medicine and advanced technology. There's absolutely a place for that. But if I don't need it and I want to have a nutrient-dense whole food diet, and I don't need any medical intervention, or I want to, you know, pursue, you know, alternative means, don't stop me from that. Don't tell me it's bad, because I'll make that decision. And, and I, that, that, I mean, that's just it. When we're force-fed things, it, 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 or somebody dictates to me what, 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 what's good for me or my family, that's, that's, when we're, that's when we've come off the rails. completely agree with what you're saying because I'm 77 and I'm trying to take care of myself. I'm trying to rebuild my microbiome. I'm trying to get rid of a chronic uh, tendency to, to have an infection. I'm, and I, I feel like I take good care of myself, but you know, it's, it's That's right. Thanks. Well, thank you for coming out absolutely. as a representative. Absolutely. That's that's a big for deal. For caring enough to show up. That's right. right. That's a big and deal. Why why is it in your opinion that big ag would be so scared of allowing small producers into the mix? What, what is that? Do they really think that we're going to carve out so much market share that it would hurt their business? You know, it's interesting that the argument that I get around big ag is, well, you can't feed the entire population in the United States with small farms. You've got to have big ag. And my wife and I went to Italy five years ago, and we were in Tuscany. And those people look phenomenal, right? I mean, there's no obesity over there, right? They're eating pasta, they're drinking wine, but they're eating within about 30 miles of their own hill town. Every single thing they consume 
was grown up within 30 to 50, I guess, kilometers, if I'm accurate, uh, from their hill town. So while what we do is not necessarily scalable, like I, I probably can't go buy another thousand acres, and re but it's replicatable. Mm -hmm. And Logan always talks about these prosperity zones. Hey, you know, you guys handle the Bonnerdale area. You guys handle Hot Spring. You guys handle Jesseville. You guys her, her, uh, handle Lonsdale. If enough people get involved and care enough, because I'm going to tell you right now, this is more purposeful that I'm doing right now at 55 years old yes. than I've ever done anything in my life. 100%. You know, I was a corporate American, did the whole corporate thing. No, that pales in comparison to seeing what Josh said earlier. You know, the families walk in, and there's blessing in that. There's abundance in that. That's right. and, and I think what we see in big ag is scarcity. And any time in your life when you're moving around and you feel scarcity, that's something to move away from. You move towards abundance, you move away from scarcity. And these prosperity zones that Logan's talking about, I think that vision is phenomenal. And and every time people come, I'm like, you need to buy chickens. You need to you need to you need to grow uh, you know get a dairy cow. You need to do honey. I'm not I'm not trying to capture the market. I want everybody doing this. If everybody does, all boats rise on a rising tide. You know, it's the, the, the opportunity that's out there. Um, there's a couple of Greek restaurants in our, in our Hot Springs area, and, and I met with them one day and just had a conversation. And they're sourcing all of their lamb from New Zealand through Sam's. Sam's Club through New Zealand. And I'm like, I could probably put a few sheep on the farm and do it organically and cut out the middleman and shipping that stuff. I mean... There's opportunities there. I just think that if you deregulate or at least allow entry into, you would have a lot more producers being a lot more innovative and putting out better product all the time. I think you're 100% right, and that's where the pharmaceutical industry comes in. Because big ag got you sick, and big pharma's going to make you stay on their drugs. Yeah. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Well, it's... Yeah. Well, it's the convenience, right? I mean, you guys are sacrificing the convenience to go and get the nutrient-dense, and so... What they've done is created this, you know, this society where, you know, uh, now you've got two incomes coming in. Uh, you know, both parents are working. It's it's all hustle. We need to go to fast food. We need to go grab the pop tarts. We need to grab the powdered donuts because it's fast. We got everything going on, and so it's become convenient, uh, and and that's where the system's broken, right? And it just goes to, you know, you talk about as a livestock producer. You know, when, when I started doing a grass-fed, grass-finished operation in 2012, everybody told me I was crazy because it was going to take me, you know, two and a half to three years to get a, a calf to finish. Uh, whereas, you know, oh, I could just pour some grain on it and have that thing in a few more months, right? Chickens, uh, you know, versus a, a five-week-old Cornish cross or a Freedom Ranger, uh, and, and, and it's going to take 12 weeks. And so everything is about speed and convenience versus actually waiting and getting something that's nutrient dense. Bingo. <laughs> You're 100% right.
And that's what they don't want, right? That's the, yeah. That's right. There you go. Yes. All right, let me give you one example. I want, I want to give you the exa an example of what I'm talking about with the corporate regulations, okay? So Smithfield goes in. Now, this, this is uh, an example coming out of Poland, but it's very pertinent to what we're talking about. Smithfield, which is a China-owned company, came in and bought an old Soviet processing facility, very, very large. So all of us have heard of Polish sausage, right? This came from artesian arbitrage okay these are little bitty processing facilities all over the country smithfield comes in and buys the soviet processing facility that's massive massive they push for legislation to require these very expensive pieces of equipment right that if you're going to process you have to have things so things like touchless sinks right you you're going to wash it now that we can we can make an argument for yeah that's safety you're not touching things but what it did was it limited all of the other small processors okay that could not afford all this equipment to close so smithville pushed for this legislation to be enacted so they could gain control that is lawfare, guys. That's what I'm talking about. We cannot treat this small abattoir like we do a five, ten thousand animal processing a day facility. We've got to have different rules for that. Nobody, as you can tell, wants somebody getting sick. Very passionate. But you know where we are. You know where we live. We are a part of the community. We have accountability because we have to face the people we work with. We have to face our consu customers, consumers, however you want to word that. My point is in Arkansas, we've got to have a focus on the small side of the system to really help it flourish. Yes, ma'am. Beautiful. So, there. Right. That there are a lot of states that are doing good things. So, who you're referring to is Raw Farms, and that's going to be a, actually a really good friend of mine, Mark McAfee. He's been on the Sewing Prosperity podcast multiple times. He also founded the Raw Milk Institute. This is what they do. They lay out through the 40 years Mark's been in the industry safe practices on what they've done right like this is not reinventing the wheel so they just recently were able to work with delaware on getting really common sense legislation on the raw milk this is also why when i said in that arkansas prosperity and food sovereignty act we have a committee that we are a part of the people right the people are on a committee that's going to help look at these legislation to make sure that corporate capture doesn't come back in because this is my opinion this gets me in trouble all the time i think that our agencies are captured okay when the health department comes in to get me in trouble 
it's been because a competitor was unhappy at something we were doing because they were losing money. It's because of a large dairy, commercial dairy, is upset because the laws hurt their sales, right? This is not about public safety. So when they do that crap, it goes back to the money every time. And that's why we cannot allow any legislation to go that's simply going to be more corporate captured to where they can come back to right where we are, to your point. But make no mistake, that's what they'll try to do. Right. You know, Logan talked a second ago about this processing facility, this gigantic processing facility. Well, let me bring it to our state. So Damon and I have been working on a processing facility in central Arkansas, USDA processing. And the idea was, hey, let's, he's got a mobile harvesting unit. You can go down the rabbit hole on this thing, but it's amazing. You go to the farm, harvest the animal on the farm. You never put that animal on a trailer. You never stress the animal. Now you're talking about phenomenal animal stewardship, right? Then you take that animal to a processing facility and get the USDA stamp so that I can actually sell you a steak because it says USDA on it, right? <laughs> Today, I can sell you a whole steer or a half a steer. Now, it's cut up in sections, and you can, you can, you see it in package like here's the steak, but you have to buy a half or a whole if it's not USDA. Now, does that make any sense? Anybody? No, that makes zero sense. So we said, well, let's figure it out because there's like 24, 27,000 producers in Arkansas. Yeah. Was well, it some huge number yeah. of 40 head on average producers, right? By the way, for our schools, we buy all that beef out of the state of Texas. Yeah. We're not even sourcing from our own state, yeah. right? And what we do is we raise these animals and we stick them into the cell barn and then Tyson buys them and puts them on feed. We're like, all right, we don't want to do that. So let's let's do our own processing facility. We we got it all figured out, and we're going to do this thing. And not only, and I talked about all boats rising on a rising tide, not only will it bless our farms, but now we've got alternatives for all these producers out there other than sticking their cow in a cell barn. Hey, we can move that beef for you. How great is that? Hey, if we do this, we've got a marketplace, and maybe we can go leverage some health care costs for your family. Hey, maybe we can help you with insurance on your fleet, on your vehicles. Hey, maybe we can help source seed together. Maybe we can leverage that as a group. Oh, that makes a ton of sense. That's great. Then there's a bill sitting out there right now that says, if you do a processing facility, to your point, I don't care how big or how small, you got to put $2.5 million in in the groundwater contamination piece. Do you know you just drummed you right out of the opportunity? Yeah. And it makes zero sense. But it's exactly what he just said. And so we're like, whoa, we, we, we need to hold off. Because we think about a million dollar facility, all of a sudden now we're putting two and a half in just the, the water filtration. No. That keeps us, that's, that keeps you from being entrepreneurial. That keeps you from growing the business. So what we're going to do from here is focus on solutions, right? We're not up here to just rant and rave. We want to have things that come to fruition that make an impact. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to invite Rhett to come up, and he's going to talk about kind of the process in which we can proceed. He's got one avenue, one, one way at which we may be able to get this done sooner than later. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Well, um, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Rhett Hatcher. I'm a, uh, uh, a lobbyist by day trade. You, every time I say that, my grandmother rolls over in her grave. Um, I'm actually a lawyer and a CPA by training. Um, it's, you never wake up one day and think this is what you're going to do. I, I started out as a police officer in the city of Van Buren, and that led me to law school, which led me to working at the Capitol, which led me to what I do now. I have uh, a firm, I have three business partners, a former state representative, a former state senator, and then a, uh, uh, a person like me that worked in state government. And we represent about 50 uh, clients. Uh, those range from large corporate uh, uh, entities like Comcast or uh, uh, some others down to nonprofits uh, like the Boys and Girls Clubs and, uh, and everything in between small businesses and things like that. And all we do is help people navigate state government. It's a state government's a large entity. It's uh, you know over 30,000 employees. 
Uh, it's $40 billion a year that gets spent in this state in one form or fashion or another, whether it's K-12 or uh, higher education or, or, or prisons or roads or anything like that. And so it's very large. Um, in Arkansas, we have a part-time legislature, but I use those air quotes because they're really, they meet all year. Um, every two years, they meet in a regular session. So we have 100 House members, 35 senators. They come together for about four months in odd years, so January of 2025, and then they'll leave in, at the end of April, and that's when something like this is going to get fixed. And so um, they'll come together, they'll consider bills, things will get filed. When they're not in regular session, you really have no power to change the laws at that point. Uh, the governor can call a special session. That rarely happens. Um, but they, they still meet and they discuss the budget. Um, they review contracts and things like that. And so that's the advantage of working with a firm like ours. There's plenty of firms like ours. There's probably 20 firms uh, like what we do where we have multi-partners and we have multi-client firms. And um, the advantage is, you know, we're up there every day. Uh, we're going and meeting with Carolyn Brown and, and uh, Cameron Cooper, who's kind of one of the big leaders in the raw milk uh, in the legislature, um, Alan Clark out of Lonsdale. And so we're meeting with these guys. We have relationships with all these guys. And so, you know, you guys have every right as individuals or collectively as a group to go up to the Capitol and, and talk to your legislators and get them to draw up the bills and, and get them filed. Um, what a firm like ours does is kind of provide that strategic insight to say, hey, you know, Big Ag, which is code for Farm Bureau, is going to, you know, they're going to talk to these people. They're going to say these things. Um, how do we counter that? You know, who are the members that we know are going to be favorable to us? Let's go talk to them first. Uh, who are the members on the committee that are going to uh, be on the fence that we need to have their local farmers talk to and, and convince them? And, uh, you know, it's just a process. A bill gets heard in a committee, moves to the House floor, then passes, then goes to a Senate committee, then moves to the Senate floor, and then passes, and the governor has to sign it, and you can work that in reverse. So there's a lot of uh, factors that if you're just coming in off the farm, like you guys are, um, you might not consider all those things. And so you can go down there, you can jam 400 people in a committee room, but if you haven't done that prep work, then you may have wasted your time and effort. Um, Although, you know, what I would tell you is we have currently right now today, we have 82 Republicans out of 100 in the House. Not that this is necessarily a partisan issue, but the idea would be that, you know, we have a freedom-loving governor, which I think we do, uh, and we should have a freedom-loving legislature, which I think on the right day we do. And if this is rightly presented, then the socialists at the health department aren't going to win. And so, um, but that's always the battle between the conservatives that we elect, and overall we've done that, and, and I'm friends with some of these people, but we got a department of communists that work at the health department, and they want to tell you how to live your life. And so, you know, now, the downside to working with a firm like ours is we have a finite amount of time, and we get paid a pretty good amount of money to give you basically some of that time. Um, and, you know, uh, it's not inexpensive, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, again, what I would tell you, just knowing what I know about this issue, and, again, I'm one of these guys that's kind of moving in that direction myself. I'm uh, big into, uh, you know, Bobby Parrish and Flav City and, and all that stuff and getting the chemicals out of our foods um, and going seed oil free and things like that. Um, you know, certainly our country's moving in this direction. And so, you know, even if you didn't have a firm like ours, I feel like if you gave yourself a little bit of organization, you could hopefully uh, get it done. But don't underestimate Farm Bureau. Don't underestimate, uh, you know, Big Ag and the amount of money and influence that they curry. Uh, and a lot of time even have the wool pulled over people that are well-meaning. Um, so anyway... That's kind of a short, Logan. I don't know. Is there any questions about what we do or anything? What, what's the timeline look like? So you said January 25. 
January 13th, I think it's 13th, 2025, this legislative session, there's going to be a lot of pomp and circumstance, and then the next day they're going to start meeting. Bills can actually be filed on November 15th. And so, you know, November 5th, we're going to have an election. We're going to know who's all in the legislature. I don't know that that's going to change a whole lot. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we're only going to have one new state senator, so basically the whole state senate's going to be back. 90% roughly of the state house is going to be back, and, of course, the governor's not up for election, so she's going to be there. But, you know, just coordinating, um, you know, who's going to file the bills, what the bills need to say, um, and then going and talking uh, to the members of the legislature. You know, uh, we have 100 House members. we got 3 million people. About 30,000 people live in each House district. If five people come and talk to a member about an issue in a House district, it feels like an avalanche. It feels like a lot. And so I think you guys can come up with more than five people in each district. But it's very, you know, that's where, again, having that person like what we do, providing that strategy, you know, you live in Lonsdale, you're the guy to go talk to Alan Clark. And I know Alan agrees with us on this issue. Um, you're not the guy to go talk to, you know, Matt Stone, who's from Camden. So we need people from Camden, El Dorado, people like that to go and, and talk to those guys. And, you know, the ultimate argument here is what you said, free market and not allowing, you know, maybe well-meaning, uh, well-intentioned, but ignorant people at the health department telling us, you know, what we can do and what we can't do. So, um, I think it's finding a sponsor, but it's also recognizing that, you know, big ag is big for a reason, and they're going to come in and, and, you know, you've got to get, there's 20 members on a House committee, so you've got to have 11 of them proactively with their butt in the seat say yes to whatever you're trying to pass. And then you've got to get 51 on the House floor. And then you've got to go and get five out of eight on the Senate floor. And I think the Senate, by the way, is more freedom-loving than the House, uh, and but they're both very good. So um, then you got to get 18 out of 35, and then you know you've pretty much done what you need to do at that point. So, um, but yeah, I would certainly say you need to start early and get organized and and talk to folks. Well. Really, well, you can uh, uh, you can file a bill in March. Your window's really until the thing ends sometime in April. Okay. Now, I say that it takes time, you know, and there's delay. So you want to get started early, and hopefully by the when this thing ends in April, you've, you've done past all your bills. Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? North Little Rock. And so you need to know who your state representative is. It's either Carolyn Brown or Brandon Aker or maybe Carlton Wing. And you need to, you know, be preparing to reach out to that person. You need to have five or six other people that are going to reach out to them and and just say, you know, this this is something I want to do of my own choice. And the state rep and then the state senator is actually best friends with Carolyn Brown. Her name's Jane English, is going to be your state senator. And so you're going to reach out to her when the bill's on her end of the, of the deal. And so, but also organizing, you know, there's 100 House members. you got to convince 51 of them. And so, and, and whichever committee this goes to, you know, you've got to convince 11 of those people. So just being organized. Yeah, thank, thank you guys. I'm going to go ahead and leave, but I'm happy to follow up. You just call me. Thank you. Thank you all. That's, uh, that's it. So the support means the world. Uh, I think kind of we got a little bit of the marching orders. Let's find out who our representatives are, legislators, and talk to them and just uh, tell them, you know, what, what we really want as citizens of Arkansas to be included in this next session. So thank you all.